We're a few days out from the Giro d'Italia of 2021. And news arrived just a couple of days ago that the race will be shown live on SBS television in Australia. It brings cycling, Grand Tour cycling, to free to air television in Australia, and that's pretty exciting. And one of the commentators will be Robbie McEwen, who's won quite a few stages of the Giro in the past, and the Tour de France, and races all around the world. So I don't really need to give you much of an introduction to Robbie McEwen, because if you're watching this channel, you'd know who he is and what he's done. And in the cycling realm, it's fair to say he's done a hell of a lot. An emphatic sprinter uh, with notable success. He uh, remains in the cycling world in a big way. And he's been the voice of cycling in Australia for quite a while now. A couple of years where he even did the international broadcast along with Matt Keenan. And this year he'll be joined by uh, Matt Keenan again and Brady O'Donnell, as they call the Giro, and later the Tour de France. The reason I originally approached him for this interview was that I wanted to talk about sprinting and commentary and the different things that he does uh, in 2021, years after he retired from racing. But after we arranged the interview, the news about the Giro came up. So we'll sort of jump from one topic to another, going on tradition with me and the way that I do my interviews. I'm just going to invite him to the studio <clears throat> and we'll see where this conversation leads us. I have no scripted questions. And uh, I'm sure he has no answers prepared, but he's a good talker, so I, so I shouldn't have to prompt him very much. Part of the appeal of talking to Robbie is that he not only knows his cycling, his sprinting, but he also knows his way around the media landscape, which has changed enormously, uh, certainly in the time that he and I have been involved uh, in cycling. And just as a, uh, a little uh, introduction, we first met in probably 1994, when he was doing the Commonwealth Bank Cycle Classic. Could have even been earlier than that. Um, and uh, Robbie's just sent me a note saying, shit. So he wants to delay it for 45 minutes, but I'm happy to do that. So there's my intro for nothing. And um, we'll get back to him in uh, a little while. Okay, bye. So I'm back and uh, Robbie is too, so I'm just going to send him the link and uh, we'll get started, we'll get talking, we'll um, uh, find out what he has to say for himself and about talking about other people and all that sort of stuff. So, could you please? Okay. Should be here soon, got a cup of tea, everything's good. Later today, I'm going to have a chat with Sam Bennett. I did that already, but uh, his team wanted me to um, and use the transcript of that exchange, which is a great shame because it was a really good interview. Anyway, that's going to feature in the official Tour de France card, which is coming out mid June 2021. And we'll talk sprinting, green jerseys, and much of uh, the kind of stuff that I'm going to talk to Robbie about. Anyway, he won't be long, I'm sure. He's prompt and as professional as he always is. What should I talk about? I'm going to talk about Cookie's jersey, Cookie's 2003 jersey. You know how he got that? He pushed his shoulder ahead of Robbie in the front of the screen on the Sean's Elisa. I don't know if I want to talk about that. Times have changed, things have moved on. You shouldn't be too long. Recording, just wait and see if he turns up this time. There he is. Okay, coming on in. Hello, young man. How are you? How are you? Good, how's it going? Not too bad, not too bad. Shit jersey in the background, by the way. <laughs> I just introduced it and I said, I better not talk about that. Robbie won't want to talk about that one. No, that's, that's shit. <laughs> only, only just gotten over it, so thanks for bringing it back up. <laughs> I'll just cover the logo somehow. Anyway, we know the story behind it. You cover it over. <laughs> Uh, thanks for joining me, Robbie. No worries. You're the television man, the the, the, the the bike rider eternally. You've just gotten back from a ride, have you? Yeah, just had a ride, yeah, just did a couple of hours. Okay. How's the trek? go to two hours. Two hours every time? Pretty much, yeah. I always do the same ride. If you look at my Strava, um, actually, people comment on my Strava. If it's not the same ride, they ask me if I'm okay. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. And how far is that over two hours? Uh, 60. 60. Okay. Really good. Fair enough. It Sorry, could be two hours out. in one. It could be an hour 54. Depends how I'm going. Yeah. Are you still racing yourself? No. No. You just rolling right along. Just cruising. Just enough to get to the end and go, yep, that'll do. That'll do. Do you get sick air on the road bike? 31. And, no, no sick air on the roadie. No. There's okay. no jumps, but I can't hit the hills fast enough to get air, so just leave it. Just a okay. mono at the turnaround point, just for shits and giggles. Of course, yeah. So you still got all your skills. You still got your passion for cycling. I thought we might talk a bit about. I mean, the, the intention of this interview was to talk about Tour de France and the broadcast and what it was like last year. You know, calling from afar and mm. then Keenan and Bridie afar from you and so on and so forth. Should we start with that? Should we start with the Giro? Yeah, Should we start with the yeah. What would you like yeah. to talk about first? Oh, I've got one thing while you were having a sip. Look at this. All right. Oh, and, <laughs> oh yeah. So, Brooken. I reckon you won yeah. that stage. No, Freire uh, beat me. I got second. Uh, and then you won the next day or the day before? I was third in Luxembourg, second in Saarbrücken, and I won in Ram. Okay. In the national champions jersey. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on a titanium light speed. Yep. Yep. Okay, old times. Let's fast forward to 2021. So the news came out uh, on Friday that you're going to be busy for the next couple of weeks as of Saturday. Hey, you've got your notes ready. You know what you're talking about. You feel well, like you're... I'm not going to be that busy initially with the Giro. I'm doing the last part. So the, okay. the nature of the Giro broadcast, it's, it's all come together pretty late. Um, and, you know, there's budget um, considerations to be made. So that's part of the reason it's being done from Melbourne. Um, and then the SBS are also sort of sharing around the, the commentary duties um, with, of course, Keno doing the whole thing as the, the lead uh, host, lead commentator. Um, but then Macca, Bridie and myself uh, are doing the rest. Uh, I believe Macca's on for the first part. Um, I think it's a week. I'm not 100% on, on the details of exactly what the others are doing, but Mac is something around the first week, Bridey something around the second week, and I'm a little bit more than the last week. Okay. And um, if all goes to script, then you get the, the exciting Jai Hindley week. You know, I don't know the, the parkour dramatically well, but I, I, I know the Giro and it tends to end in the Dolomites. Um, what, do you, what do you make of what we can expect? Last year we had 18 Australians in the race and a runner-up and a few stage wins along the way with Ben O'Connor. Oh, if we yeah, if we can get that all over again, that'd, that'd be unbelievable. I mean, it'd be great for the Aussie viewers to be able to tune in, in, in en masse and watch it um, because, as we know, over the last few years with, with SBS not being able to show the Giro because um, Eurosport owned the exclusive rights, uh, a lot of people missed out on, on witnessing the incredible performances by some young Aussies in the Giro. Um, you know, not to mention Caleb as well, but, uh, you know, guys who, who hadn't been known to the, the greater public like Ben O'Connor and like Jai Hindley, um, you know, they did incredibly well last year in the Giro and showing good signs at the moment going into this year. Um, you know, we'd love to, to see that again. Um, although I'm doing the, the last part of the Giro where the race tends to really unfold, um, sometimes completely unravel, which is fantastic viewing uh, in, the, in the Dolomites. Um, I will... I kind of wish I was able to to commentate on the the flat stages and the sprints as well because the Giro sprints are always really cool and uh, really fun to analyse as well. And it looks like we're going to see um, a head to head between um, Caleb and Dylan Krunewegen, who's um, back on the roster, which is really good to see. I'm I'm pleased for him and that you know, hopefully he can put the whole Tour of Poland and incident with Fabio Jakobsen behind him. It's going to be tough coming back into the peloton for him. But yeah, it'd be nice to be able to you know, commentate on and analyse those sprints. But um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the, to the final week of the Giro. Even just with that dialogue there, we could go on a number of tangents. But let's just talk about Dylan for a second, if we can. I mean, Grunewegen's had a really, must have been a horrible last few months, like just coming to terms with what's happened. He's been vilified. 
He's uh, certainly by the public, and I don't think he's terribly popular in the peloton. Have you you would have interviewed him in the past, and um, how do you come back from something like that? What would what would your strategy be? Well, I've I've actually never interviewed him, but I've spoken to him a number of times in the past, um, and you know he he has had a a tough time over the last few months. But having said that, um, nowhere near as tough a time as uh, Fabio Jakobsen. But I, I think it's it's fitting now that you know he's he's taken his punishment, he's he's had the time out, his his ban is expiring, and I think the thing that will placate a lot of people, um, certainly not everybody, of course, is those are very strong opinions. He should never race again and all this sort of stuff. But it was a racing incident. It came out really badly, of course. But I think the the thing that should placate a lot of people is that. Hrunewegen, he's served his time, but also Fabio Jakobsen has made his return to racing and he rode the Tour of Turkey and finished it and, and played a role for the team. So that's really encouraging. And that was that was really, really nice to see um, Jakobsen back in the peloton. So, you know, it's it's time that Hrunewegen can make his return. Um, it'll be really interesting to see how he goes, you know, stepping straight into the Giro first race after, um, you know, being out since, I don't know, last September. Um It'll be really tough for him, but it'll be a, a good way to, to get back into it. And I'm sort of hoping that he can get through, you know, 12 or 14 days of the Giro, um, build some race condition, and that his team then considers taking him to the Tour because the Tour, looking at last year, could really use Krunewegen in the sprints, um, you know, going head-to-head with, with Caleb and Sam Bennett and the rest, and um, you know that as a as a viewer and a commentator, that's what I'd love to see. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, they've got uh, Primoz Roglic in there in the the Jumbo Visma lineup, and you're still trying to get a sprinter to come in and win a few more stages. Well, Fanart was doing that for them pretty well last year. I imagine he'll do the same again. And he was also, you know, a, a steam train at the front of the bunch, doing a lot of work. Is Runeve from that kind of right? Uh, well, he's not the guy to sit on the front of the bunch. Um, he, he might be able to do so very, very early in a stage just to save his teammates a few kilometres on the front, but he's certainly not going to do anything um, like Wild Van Aert did in the in the mountain stages. But could you imagine Wild Van Aert leading out Dylan Grunewegen? Um, you know, that would really give uh, Mikael Murku and Sam Bennett something to think about and um, it would be an incredible battle for the, for the lead-out train and then see which one Caleb would choose and come off. Uh, so it's it it really it really is a uh, something that whets the appetite. But um, you know, we'll see how he goes through the through the Giro first and what his team decides. Just talk to me about that sort of assignment of the GC team versus the sprint team. I know that uh, two thousand seven, two thousand and eight, you were in that predicament. It uh, was probably predict a lot of. Maybe it was De Vidamon. I can't remember the predict in well. It, it sort of started in De Vidamon. Cadell ran fifth, and then. Uh, in 07, it was predict a lotto, and uh, you know I was out after the first week with a knee injury, um, so you know that wasn't it wasn't a thing. But you know that at, at that time, none of the lotto teams, um, you know whatever the sub sponsor was, or none of the lotto teams of that time um, really had the horsepower, had the the climbing talent in the team to be a a real GC team. But we also weren't. A full sprint team. We had a number of domestiques that sort of just managed to get everything back together, and sometimes one, maybe two lead out guys. Um, so it was Lotto was sort of not one nor the other, um, but we did a pretty good job. Yeah, and and in that sort of harking back to your career, but it's for an Australian audience. So I just wonder what that vibe was like in London, for example. I remember being at the press conference with the two of you, and uh, you were having a pretty good fun, you know, with Cadell. Yeah, well, it's a great time. But I think Cadell enjoyed the role of underdog, and I probably did too, somewhat. Even though I didn't, I didn't feel an underdog. I think people looked at the team and considered us underdogs because we didn't have a big lead-out train or anything. But um, you know, Cadell at that point just had to try and go with the best in the mountains, and and you know, he ended up finishing second overall, which was incredible. Um, and then in you know, in the in the sprints, I was confident if if he could be a bunch sprint. I could, with the help of one or maybe two teammates, get my way towards the front and find my own way. And I, I really wasn't concerned about the makeup of the team or if we were weighted too far in one direction or, 
um, it wasn't wasn't a concern. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, sort of go forward to, to modern cycling. And having just watched the Lance uh, documentary on the SPN or uh, on KO over the last weekend, I've sort of ducked back to times that I've sort of almost deliberately forgotten about and you understand why. Um, but um, it, what I found really interesting is just looking at the bagginess of the jerseys and the ill-fitting <laughs> clothing and things like that. And it wasn't that long ago, but it just felt like we were watching people riding around in, I don't know. Like yeah, everyone was flapping in the breeze. Um, yeah. yeah, it is funny when you look back then and see, like you say, the loose jerseys and just... Um, I, I look at some of the equipment that I rode, even at the time, um, and I thought, oh, this is okay. And then I looked at the equipment I was on and looked at what some of my rivals were riding and thought, gee, I've underdone it on the tech side. Um, you know, way less aero, um, heavier. But, you know, it's just that's what we had to work with. Um, you know, then it got a little bit better after that. But, yeah, it's things moved really quickly in the last uh, 10 or 12 years, that's for certain. We can just quickly on product front because you, last week or the week before it was announced that you've become a Trek ambassador. So you've got, I would imagine, a, a fair quiver of bikes at your disposal, including mountain bike and road bikes. The Madone is their Aero one and the Amonda is their Aero lightweight climbers bike. What do you ride on the road? I'm riding the Madone. Uh, so they've gone the, the full Aero. Um, I've got the... The Shram Axis ETAP 12 speed group set, and um, I'm actually riding the uh, the 303 Firecrest wheels at the moment. I've got also 454s, which is super aero, um, and I'm looking forward to getting a set of the brand new 353s, which I'm, I'm hoping will be on the way shortly. So you still need that extra speed, even when you're just uh, doing two hour rides at six, for 60k. It just feels good. But I tell you what, getting on the Madone, it, it, you feel fast when you're riding slow. It's that good a bike. It just feels so nice. And it's quite light as well. Um, for the for how aerodynamic it is, it's actually really lightweight compared to what I've had in the past in terms of aero bikes. It's, um, you know, just that tech has gone gone forward in leaps and bounds. So, yeah, beautiful bikes. But um, I'm having a lot of fun on the mountain bike. Um, I was in Derby last week. I, I actually... Um, got a rental bike from the store down there, a Trek Remedy. But um, you know, the one I ride here at home now is a, a Super Calibre. It's a full XC bike. It's just beautiful. And I've also got a CX bike, a Boone, that uh, people would be familiar with from seeing uh, Sven Nass race around on it when he was still riding, still racing. There you go. We, it's funny, isn't it? I texted you and said, I don't know what topic we're going to cover in particular, but we've suddenly found ourselves talking about bikes and equipment. Mm -hmm. Just talk to me a bit about like what you've noticed while you're riding because I know that you're still super keen and you're not taking sort of second rate equipment. Like how would it have, how much faster do you reckon things would have been back in your day if you had what you've got now? Like I'm not I don't know how you put a figure on it, but can you well, sort of I mean, you'd, you'd, so basically you'd take you'd take almost any any generation from go back almost as far as you want. I mean, let's go back let's go back um thirty five 40 years, you take any of the top riders from any generation through there and you, you know, you're able to teleport them to now and all sprint it. But it'd be, you know, the same speeds they're doing now, give, give or take a point something of a kilometre an hour. Um, you know, that's, that's the fastest. Um, probably you're lucky you can't do that because there'd be just enormous crashes with so much, so much talent and horsepower trying to be at the front of the bunch. <laughs> And it's a similar topic. No, it's not. But the super, the, the super tuck that's been banned, you're going to be talking about that for a bit in the coming weeks, I would imagine. Uh, you four again. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Emily. And Sammy, <laughs> my <the> wife. <laughs> um, I've spoken with a few bike riders and I know that like Mark Renshaw is pretty happy with the ruling. I think uh, Nico Roach is also pretty pleased that they made some changes. So um, how would you... Well, you didn't do the super tuck, did you? Or like, what, yeah, what's the view? I was going around years ago. First bloke I ever saw do the super tuck was um, Hank Vogels on a training camp in the Snowy Mountains back in 1994. And, so, uh, 
any anyone who says any different that oh yeah that it only started being used in 2000 and something or whatever rubbish um and guys have done very similar things um you know even even back in the 80s with hands in the center of the bars although they did have their have their bum perched on the front of the seat um hink was the first one i saw sit on the top tube to do it and then that, that just became the way we raced each other downhill yeah and, and it's real bad that it's gone and how, how can they police it you've been in the peloton there's surely going to be plenty of examples of people doing it, oh but... there's, there's just cameras everywhere you know that in, just in general life too not just in in sports there's cameras everywhere you can't get away with anything i think that i mean i don't really have a problem with the super tuck um you know riders are in in good control i haven't seen a you know a big crash caused by a super tuck um everybody moving in the same direct direction at roughly the same speed it's okay what i don't like to see is guys riding on the front of the peloton with their arms draped over the bars in a sort of time trial position um with just the forearms on the bars um you know on your own whatever um but on the front of the bunch it's it's yeah not a, not a good one it takes one guy who thinks he's got it under control to hit a bump come off and bring down half the bunch so i'm not i'm not sorry to see that one go um but the super tuck i didn't have a, a problem with i didn't think it was uh, particularly dangerous is the sport being over governed uh yes 